Just a real quick uh, note here. My name is Kurt Van Gordon. I'm the director of two missions. One mission is uh, the Utah Gospel Mission that began in Salt Lake City in 1898 under Reverend John D. Nutting and the Salt Lake City Ministerial Association. I've been running that mission, recruiting missionaries to come into the state from south to north, east to west. Uh, we've done short-term missions here uh, since 1979 that I've been running that mission. I'm uh, also the director of another mission called the, did I do something wrong? Do not, okay, we're using this mic and I've got, this one's okay now? I apologize. And uh, the other mission is uh, Jude 3 missions, uh, where we reach out to other people in other cults. I was never a Latter-day Saint. I was a member of another cult called the Children of God and came out of that in 1972. And it was through my Mormon grandmother after I uh, left the Children of God. I had my own prophet, uh, Moses David Berg, uh, in Huntington Beach, California. I actually met him in in uh, Dallas, Texas in 1972 and joined that group thinking it was just another extension of the Jesus movement and spent uh, half a year with it and then realized uh, after reading the word of God that I was being deceived by this prophet. Okay, he's sending another mission, another message to me. What am I doing wrong? and I didn't know green from orange. <laughs> and so I left this group called the Children of God, uh, went to Ohio where I grew up, and uh, sat down with, on the advice of my mother. She said, just give the pastor one chance, your childhood pastor, uh, to sit down and talk with you about your involvement in this group. And she didn't call it a cult right away. Time Magazine was calling it a cult. We were all denying it. And I sat down with my boyhood pastor. We had our own collection of scriptures about as thick as this. And it was called Mo Letters. Moses David Berg wrote his own letters called Mo Letters. And uh, we thought they were scripture, modern day scripture. So you see the parallel here. So I sat down with my pastor. And he said, uh, do you mind if I look at these? So I gave him a set of them. And I thought, well, I'm going to teach you something about the spirit of God. I'm going to teach you something about who God is and what a prophet's all about real smart aleck young man. And then uh, the pastor sat down and said, can I write on these? And what was interesting about this pastor is he sat down on the couch beside him instead of sitting over a desk lecturing me. So we sat down side by side with uh, these Mo letters and he began reading it and he said, do you mind if I write on this? And I said, no, go ahead. And uh, he'd read a paragraph and then he'd flip a, through a few pages in his Bible and he'd write a Bible verse down. And then he'd read a little bit more, and he'd look at his Bible, and he'd write another Bible verse down. And he'd read a little bit more, and he'd, write another, and he'd just continued doing this. After a page or two, I began to sweat bullets. And I realized, you're in trouble, Kurt. You don't know your Bible like this man knows his Bible. All you knew were these Mo letters. And so he said to me, Kurt, what I'm going to ask you to do is this. I'm going to ask you to open up those Mo letters that you have, and read the section that I put a line by, and then we're going to open the Bible together, and I want you to read just as loud the Bible verse that I put beside of it. So I read that verse from my prophet, and I then read the Bible verse that went alongside of it, and I saw that it contradicted, but I wasn't going to let him know. And so I did the next one, and again, I saw a contradiction, but I wasn't going to tell him. And the next one, and the next one, this went on for about a half a dozen times, and I just burst into tears. I said, Pastor, what's wrong? What's wrong with me? Am I, am I going to hell? And he said, no, you're not going to hell. You've been deceived. You've been deceived by a false prophet. And so it was through that method that he got me out of the children of God, and I've been using that method ever since to win Mormons to the Lord, Jehovah's Witnesses to the Lord, children of God people to the Lord, and many others. I understand your feelings, those of you who are ex-Jehovah's Witnesses and ex-Mormons, of coming out of a group and, and actually longing to still be in it for weeks and months after you come out of it. That's an emotional tie that you have. Because when the children of God would come through town, I too would see them dancing in the park, and I'd go contact this pastor. I said, strangest thing, I just feel like I want to join him again. But I know intellectually I know it's wrong. But in my 
my heart. I just love these people. I want to be with them. He said, let's turn that into evangelism. We grabbed our Bibles. We went down there, and we saw them singing and playing their guitars, and we sat down with them and started sharing with them like he shared with me. And that's when the Lord started that ministry that I have today to people in the cults. Well, I had Jehovah's Witness relatives and a Mormon grandmother. A Mormon grandmother saw me go in this group and come out of this group, so she must have thought, well, he's ripe for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We'll send the young missionaries over to him. They're about his age, and, and uh, he'll convert to, to my faith. So I sat down with the Mormon missionaries, and that was in the days when they had these, these flip charts, and Mr. Brown, whoever he was, and they had these flip charts, and they would say, Mr. Brown, I was Kurt, and they'd say, uh, do you see this prophet writing scripture? You remember these flip charts? And this was Moses, the way he wrote scripture. We're, we're here to tell you about another prophet. And they showed Joseph Smith with golden plates and say that this is our prophet who wrote scripture much like Moses wrote scripture back in the days of old. Wouldn't it be nice to know that God has a living prophet leading his church today? I said, been there, done that. And they looked at me. They said, what? And I said, well, I was in a group called the Children of God. And I had my prophet. I've already had a prophet like that. And it didn't work. And this wasn't working for them by this time. So then they go to the next part of the flip charts. They start telling me about additional scripture. And I said, been there, done that. I had my Mo letters. And that was my additional scripture. Just like you have your additional scripture with the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price and the Doctrine and Covenants. So it was after I went through the missionary lessons that I realized there's more than one cult out there. It wasn't just the children of God, but my grandmother was in a cult. She was in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, following a false prophet, just like I did, following uh, after the scriptures of this false prophet, just like I did. And so I wanted to witness to my grandmother. And my mother, who was a Baptist, uh, we got together, got some books. I got Walter Martin's book, Kingdom of the Cults, called him up, got to know him by phone from Ohio, and ended up working for him for a number of years. And I'm the oldest living editor of Walter Martin's books, still editing his books and writing his books with his family. And uh, it's been a, a ministry that I've been doing since the 1970s. Now, in our message today, I'm going to be sharing with you about the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. But before I do that, I'd like to have you turn in your Bibles, if you have them with you today, to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3. This is a very important passage, which I think parallels a lot of what we're dealing with here in this kind of a conference. There was a time on the Mount of Olivet that Jesus sat down and his disciples came to him. And it said in verse 3, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said to him, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Two questions with three parts. When shall these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered and said to them in verse 4, Take heed that no man deceive you. Do you find it interesting, my friends, that in the group that I was in, the children of God was a new cult, the Unification Church is a new cult with its own prophet, its own scripture. Uh, the ISCON, International Society of Christian Consciousness, came to America with their prophet and their new scriptures. You have uh, the other cults that have sprung up since then, Est and Lifespring, Silver Mind Control, and all the other new cults in our age. And what did Jesus say was the sign of the last days? Take heed that no man deceive you. The first sign that Jesus gave that we are in the last days is deception. He talks about other things as signs of the times. And we have a lot of good Bible teachers who are telling us about the signs of the times, but many of them are missing the most important one, which is the first one that Jesus gave, and that is deception shall be all around you. Verse 11 says this, And many false prophets will rise up and deceive many as a sign of the times. We have prophets all around us, especially with the New Age movement. Prophets and prophetesses 
all around us, deceiving many. That's a sign of the last days. And verse 24, again in the same chapter, for false Christs and false prophets will rise up and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Here we have the message of Jesus. Three times he said and repeated in the same chapter as, what shall be the sign of your coming? What shall be the end of the age? When, when will we know that these things take place? And the answer was, watch out. It's a warning. Deception shall be all around you. There will be false Christs, false messiahs. There will be false prophets. What we're going to be talking about today is Joseph Smith's translation as a prophet of God. And did he actually match a legitimate translation of the Hebrew from the Old Testament, Aramaic from the Old Testament, and the Greek of the New Testament? I have several of the Mormon scriptures here with me. And James, in his last message, he forgot to do this. He asked me if he could borrow. Uh, he talked about the lectures of faith quite a bit. He asked if he could borrow this and show it to you, and he forgot to do it, so I'm going to do it for him. That I have uh, one of the 18, 1918 editions uh, on my book table, and this is for sale, of the uh, Doctrine and Covenants with the Lectures of Faith still being published in it. So anybody that may want that for their library, I have that along with other books. Uh, you'll see the book tables. You've got some wonderful resources out here, aside from what James had already given to you in your last lecture. Uh, I have uh, several of the older research volumes, like the Journal of Discourses, History of the Church, and different things like that available for you for your further studies. The works of Joseph Smith, though, that we're going to be looking at today is what's commonly called two different names, the inspired version, where Joseph Smith sat down with his own Bible and retranslated it from the King James Version into what's called the inspired version. This one that I have is a parallel column of the King James on one side and the inspired version on the other. This was prepared by the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints back in their day and uh, now called the Community of Christ. And then the Joseph Smith translation called JST in the footnotes of the common volume of the King James Scripture by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, many of you have recognized this. Some of you probably even own one of these. Where in the footnotes, again, aside from uh, cross-references with the other Mormon scriptures, they have a JST in capital letters, which is the reference for uh, the Joseph Smith translation. So in effect, Mormon missionaries and Mormon believers have two translations in one. They have the King James at the top and then the Joseph Smith translation, uh, which is their preferred translation at the bottom. Before we get into examining the Joseph Smith translation, I'd first like to go through a small ground-laying uh, example of why we believe in the Bible as God's Word. Uh, you have your handout. You can follow along with me on this of what is the Bible first. Philosophers have said for many years that Christians use circular logic because we use the Bible to prove the Bible. You ask a Christian a question about the Bible, they quote the Bible. You ask them how they know that's true, they quote the Bible. And you ask them another question about that being true, and they quote the Bible. And it's a mistake of philosophers to say that when you are quoting one passage of the Bible and another passage of the Bible, that you're using circular reasoning, you're using the Bible to, def to defend itself. But what they fail to understand is that the, li the Bible is a library of books. A library of 66 books penned by 44 authors over a span of 1,500 years with Moses being at the beginning, at 1425 B.C., and John the Apostle being at the end with the book of Revelation at 95 A.D. One thing I always tell people when I teach them to go out and witness or take them witnessing with me, and we do our mission work, is that God is the author of this text. Get it in your mind, get it in your heart, get it in your soul, that you don't want to say that Paul was the author. You don't want to say that Matthew was the author. You don't want to say that Moses was the author. God is the author. Matthew was a writer. Moses was a writer. Job was a writer. God is the author. So I always want to direct people to that point, that God is the author of this library of books. 
It was written in rather a unique way for a collection of books on three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. And it was also written in three languages, Hebrew, small portion of it in Aramaic, the book of Daniel, and uh, parts of the book of Daniel, and then Greek for the New Testament. And it has a unified message of one story, and that is God's redemption of mankind. The books are divided into 39 books for the Old Testament and 27 books of the New Testament. And the Old Testament is further divided by the Jewish people into three parts, the law, which sometimes is referred to as the Torah, the prophets, which are sometimes divided into the major prophets and the minor prophets, or the earlier prophets and the later prophets, former and latter, and then the writings. The writings being the poetical books. Uh, the five roles also would be one description of them, or the historical. Now Jesus acknowledged, I want to point this out to you, Jesus acknowledged what I'm sharing with you right now. If you look in your Bibles at Luke chapter 24 and verse 44, he gives these same three portions of, of the Old Testament scripture that I just mentioned to you. Luke 24, verse 44, Then he said to them, These are the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, that's one, and in the prophets, that's two, and in the Psalms, which would be also the other word for the writings, that's three, concerning me. So what Jesus is telling the people is the old Old Testament, the entire Old Testament, all three portions as you have divided it, is all about me. As Calvary Chapel has as their statement, it's all about Jesus. You can look at the Old Testament and you can say, it's all about Jesus. That's what he's saying. He's saying, it's all about me. Jesus also attested to the Jewish arrangement of the Old Testament when he spoke of the death of Abel and Zechariah. This is a good attestation of the Old Testament, my friends, of what Jesus said here. Is there any proof that the 39 books that we have are the same books that Jesus used? Yes, I just gave you one, but I'm going to give you another. Luke chapter 11 and verse 51. One thing I will mention as you're turning to that or looking at that is that the Jewish people had 24 books in their Old Testament because they didn't divide 1st and 2nd Kings. They just had kings. They didn't divide 1st and 2nd Samuel, they just had Samuel. They didn't divide 1st uh, and 2nd Chronicles, they just had Chronicles. Same books, but they just had less of a division than what we have, so they had 24, we have 39 of the same writings. But here's what Jesus said, and I want to point this out for a reason. Luke eleven fifty one. 51. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. Listen, friends. Genesis, the first person killed, was Abel. From the blood of Abel. Chronicles was the last book of the Jewish arrangement. The last person killed, Zechariah. The blood of Zechariah. So you have Jesus attesting to the same books that we have, from Genesis to Chronicles was the order of the Jewish scriptures. Same books that we have, we just ordered them historically, chronologically, rather than the way they had them. The New Testament contains four Gospels, the Acts of the Apostles, and the Epistles to the Church. And the New Testament writers were directed by the Holy Spirit. We see this in two passages from Jesus again. In John chapter 14 and verse 26, and John chapter 16 and verse 13, Jesus said in John 14, 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, now listen to this, and bring to your remembrance all things I have said to you. How trustworthy is the Bible then? He will bring to your remembrance. Do you have any question then that Matthew remembered what he was supposed to remember? Why do we have just those stories in Matthew? Because that's what the Holy Spirit caused him to remember. He will bring it to your remembrance. Why did Mark write what he wrote? Because the Holy Spirit guided him 
to remember those things. Luke, the same thing. John, the same thing of what I've said to you. And then in chapter 16 and verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you unto all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. So again, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit guiding these writers of the New Testament. Jesus promised this. I often say to Latter-day Saints or anyone else that I'm witnessing, do you, do you think that Jesus broke his promise? He promised that this is what would be recorded. Now, when we deal with the question of, is the Bible reliable? I sit down with Mormon missionaries many times. We have one. Mormon missionaries to the Lord while they're on their mission. People say that can't be done. It's been done. I can introduce you to them. We had one uh, young man who was so thirsty for the Lord. I happened to be on the mission up here in Utah. We had our workers with our mission who had just left Utah and gone back to California. And uh, you know how the Mormon missionaries work. They have their companion, and the companion is supposed to keep each other out of trouble. And uh, it didn't work with this couple, and that was, a, that was another arrangement by the Lord, where this one young missionary by the name of Dean in Orange County just came to the door of one of our return missionaries. We have our own return missionaries. <laughs> and knocked on the door. And uh, this young lady answered the door, and she had all the study notes and everything she had gone through with her training. And she said, just a minute, I'll be right back. She ran to get her notes. And I, I teach people the same thing that I'm teaching you now. Never be afraid to sit down with your notes in front of a Mormon missionary or a Jehovah's Witness. They sit down with their watchtowers in front of you. They, I mean, we have this idea we have to memorize everything. No, you don't. Get your confidence in your notes. Write notes in your Bible. I tell people to do that all the time. If your Bible is not, if it's too good to write in, then buy a cheaper one that's easier to write in for you. <laughs> one more budgeted. And so this missionary knocked on the door, and his companion, though, this is the interesting part of the story, was distracted because he had fallen for a girl, which they aren't supposed to do on the mission. So he was really antsy to see this girl as much as he could. And that left Dean to be able to talk with our return missionary. So they sat down with their notes from our Bible classes and just explained to this, these two missionaries, one's daydreaming, the other one's listening. And the one listening is the one who ended up accepting Jesus. But it was through a series of interesting events. We would, they would call me up and say, hey, this is where we're at on this. And I'd say, well, let me photocopy some things. I'm over at BYU. I'll photocopy these, send them down to you. Send them down. This is back in the days of photocopying instead of Internet. And I'd send it down to them. And they'd give it to Dean, and they'd go over to his apartment, and uh, he'd be taking the garbage out. They'd arrange this. They'd slip it under the garbage can, and he'd go take the garbage out, pick up the uh, uh, information, and take it back in his, to his room and read it. And he would go through this time after time after time. And you know what it is for a Mormon missionary to return with honor. And if they don't return with honor, that's dishonor. So this was getting to Dean to the point that he was perplexed about what he was going to do. So he thought, I'll, I'll start sending my father these same documents. He started sending the photocopies to his father in Michigan. And so after a, a series of weeks, this went on. And they said, we think he's close. And I said, well, this is great. We'll keep praying. And eventually, Dean just came to, to his knees and said, I am repenting of Mormonism. It is a false doctrine. I'm following a false doctrine. He's still on his mission. And I want to leave my mission, but I don't know how to do it. I'm going to call my father. Well, he'd been sending all these documents to his father. He gets on the phone with his father, and he says, Dad, I have something to tell you. His dad said, no, I've got something to tell you, son. His dad said, no, I've got something to tell you first. No, you're my son. I'm going to tell you I want you to come home. Well, why would you want me to come home? I'm not done with my mission. Because we have talked to a Baptist pastor here in Michigan, and we found out that Mormonism was wrong with these documents you sent us, and we're leaving the church. And he said, hallelujah, I'm leaving the church too. And they all left together, went back to Michigan. And I'm not kidding you, this divided the entire ward this is one group after another group after another group just started coming out in a chain reaction because someone was, was not uh, unafraid to take their own notes and share it in front of a Mormon missionary. So we've seen Mormon missionaries come to the Lord on their mission. I share these things with them, just like I'm sharing with you, that the Holy Spirit promised that these things 
would be reliable. And I ask them that. Do you believe Jesus broke his promise? They don't want to say he broke his promise. So this gives them a problem. Jesus promised that. So the writers knew that they were directed of God. Luke chapter 1 and verse 3. Luke said it this way, It seemed good to me, also having had perfect understanding. Oh, this is rich in the Greek. And that's from the New King James Version is what I'm preaching from today. Having a perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. So he had a perfect understanding, directed by God, the Holy Spirit. Peter said that Paul's writings were scripture. Now you've got to understand this. Peter and Paul at one time were at odds. But by the end of it, Peter was then saying, all of Paul's epistles are equal to scripture. This lays a foundation. We have one apostle telling us, as the church, Listen to Paul, because he's another apostle, and he wrote scripture. So nobody, nobody has to question whether Paul was authored by God, or authorized by God to write scripture. As our brother, or our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, in 2 Peter 3.15 is where I'm at, has written to you, as also in his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do the rest of Scripture. So Peter's telling us that Paul's writings are equal to the rest of Scripture. And what we find here is that what Joseph Smith translated in the Joseph Smith inspired version or the Joseph Smith translation, he wrestled with the very things that Peter talked about here. He wrestled with the ideas of what Paul laid out. And he changed several of these in his own translation. Now, why do we believe the Bible over any other work? That's a good question. Well, for one, it's the only place where God said, or is said to have spoken, and then he verified it through unmistakable evidences. These things are not based upon myths. We find that out in Scripture. They're based upon eyewitness accounts. We find that out in Scripture. And the Scripture even tells us that there are many infallible proofs of the things that God did. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16 is one of the verses I give to you. For we did not follow cunning devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Luke wrote, Inasmuch as many have taken the hand to set an order and narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. We have two accounts then, Luke and Peter, telling us that we are eyewitnesses of these things, and they know the eyewitnesses of these things. So they aren't myths, they aren't fables. What you have in your hand is the real deal. 1 John, John was one of the eyewitnesses. He said this. I want you to listen to 1 John chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2. The way he explains it is so rich. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, see the senses he's using? Which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. He's using the senses here. The hearing, the sight, the handling, concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. And then Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, also written by Luke, concerning Jesus and his appearances. He also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proof. So if you were to ask the apostles, what's the proof you have? They were infallible. One touched the print of the nails, the side. It was told by Jesus, reach forth your hand and touch it. Infallible proofs. Another time, he appears in a closed room. Infallible proofs. It was seen by them for 40 days, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. 
Now, the purpose of the Bible is to tell us the story of God's plan for man's redemption through Jesus Christ. Its purpose centers upon Jesus Christ and his mission. His salvation is the reason for why these things are recorded. We find that in John chapter 20 and verse 30. If you ever want to know why the Bible was written, or at least we could say this about the book of John, since it's recorded there in chapter 20 and verse 31. But these things are written. Why was this written? These things are written that you might believe. Now listen, many other things could have been written, John tells us also. But why were these things written? That's the question. So that you would believe. This is what I use as the argument of sufficiency. That the Gospel of John alone, because it records this, is enough. It is sufficient enough without any other books for you to believe. The argument is sufficiency. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. If John needed more to be said, he would have had more chapters. But this is the sufficiency argument. This much was written. These things were written that you would believe. We used to say it this way about the Jehovah's Witnesses when we talk with them about John 1.1, 1, 1, where they add the word, the definite article A. How many arguments do they need? How many verses do they need? If they don't accept that verse, will 12 verses convince them? Will 100,000 verses convince them? See, this is the sufficiency argument. John wrote what he wrote that you may believe in the name of the Son of God and believing you may have life in his name. We call the Bible the Word of God because God's words are found in it. It says so itself. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, all Scripture, all encompassing, all Scripture is given by theopneutos, that's the Greek word, by God's breathing. So you can't even say a word to me without breathing. That's how we project our voice. That's what the word is used here, theopneutos, that it's God's breath to you. That's what the Word of God is. It's His voice to you. It's His breath to you. It's theopneutos. We use the word inspiration to translate it this way. And it is profitable for four things. Count them. Profitable for doctrine. You want to know where your doctrine comes from? It's right here in the Word of God. It's profitable for reproof. That means to give a defense. To give an answer. For reproof. For correction. If you need to be corrected, you go here. You don't go to psychology. Not first, anyway. You don't go to all the other sources that mankind can dream up for correction. You go to God's Word. It corrects us. And for instruction in righteousness. You want to be instructed in the ways of God? You go to the Bible. You don't go to Sunday school manuals, even. You don't go to magazines. You don't go to movies. You don't go to Christian radio. You go to God's Word for instruction in righteousness. Four reasons He gave us for His Word existing. So what does God say about his word? He magnifies his word above his own name. Psalm 138, and verse 2. Think of that. How high is the name of God? How valuable is the name of God? He magnifies his word above his own name. Think of your name. What do you put above your own name? See, this is what God said. He said, you like my name? I'm putting my word above it. He magnifies it above his own name. Psalm 12, verse 6, his word is pure. Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 21, people talk about the gathering of the books together for the collection of the 66 books that we have. He says it's going to be this way for generation to generation. He will preserve it is what Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 21 tells us. He will preserve it from generation to generation. That means nothing's going to be lost out of it. All of the books that people talk about being missing from the Bible are not missing books. They're only historical references. And so there's nothing missing. What is supposed to be here, God has preserved, and Jesus already sanctioned the Old Testament that we already have, the same books. It cannot be altered without discovery. Proverbs chapter 30 and verses 5 and 6. This one is one of my favorites if you want to turn to this. Proverbs chapter 30 and verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. That's rich. Do not add to his words. 
Here's two editions I'm going to show you, the Joseph Smith translations. Do not add to his word, lest he reprove you and you be found a liar. See, it's not going to be me that reproves him. I can do the research to find it, but it's really God reproving him. It's God reproving Mary Baker Reddy with her science and health with keys of the scripture where she adds to God's word. It's God who reproves the Watchtower Society where they've added to the New World Translation and changed God's word. It's God who reproves Joseph Smith where he adds to his word. And each one of them are found a liar. I can't say it any kinder than God said it. If that's unkind, then blame God. And that's another thing. When I witness to people and I read God's word, I don't water it down any. I don't try to say something nicer than what God said. I figure God's the, the, the all-loving one. If he says liar, I say liar. He says thief, I say thief. I don't, try, don't try to change it or water it down. And God says they're liars. And I tell Mormon missionaries that. My God says your, your prophet is a liar because he added to God's word. Well, they don't like that. Yeah. But that's the truth. It stands forever. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 18. Jesus said this. I say to you, oh, I, I love this one too. I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot, not one tittle, will by any means pass from the law until it's fulfilled. See, Jesus fulfilled it all. Nothing's going to pass from it. It's going to stand. And we find in 1 Peter 1.25, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now, why is this important for me to lay this kind of a foundation before we get into the Joseph Smith translation? If the word of God is false, then we have no basis for our faith. So I wanted to give you a ground for your own faith here. 1 Corinthians 15, 14, where Paul is speaking of the resurrection, and he writes this. And if Christ is not written, risen, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is in vain. What he's saying is, this word is true. All those infallible proofs are true because if that thing is false, then you have nothing to preach. Terry Long has nothing to say up here. I have nothing to say up here. All of it's just empty words and you don't even have a faith. How do you like that? Your faith is vain. It's empty if Christ did not raise from the dead, if these things are not true, all the prophecies that looked forward to his resurrection and all the fulfillment that he had of those prophecies and his actual resurrection and ascension, all those things are true. And if they aren't, then I have nothing to say to you. That's how true the word of God is. That's how important this is. So if the word of God is true, also then the world does need to repent, just like any one of us who are believers has before him. Now, the beginning of the Joseph Smith translation. My wife and I have been to Independence, Missouri several times. And I visited the headquarters of the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, today known as the Community of Christ. And I've personally seen and handled Joseph Smith's 1828 uh, Bible that he wrote all of the inspired additions to. And I've also seen the uh, tablet that goes alongside of that, uh, where some of the changes that he made in uh, his retranslation of the Bible uh, were so voluminous that he was not able to even put it in the column uh, of his 1828 Bible. Uh, so he had a tablet that went alongside, and he'd write the verse out, and then write out whatever he wanted uh, to change in the Bible. So I've seen his writing tablet that accompanies it. I've seen his handwritten notations. I've seen where his pen strikes through Bible verses, strikes through Bible words, and then writes new words above it and below it and in the margin. And I've seen the additions that he penned alongside of it. Now, what gives a man the confidence to take his pen to the Bible? As my wife used to say, more modern, take white out to the Bible. But take his pen to the Bible and retranslate it or rewrite it as what Joseph Smith did without any Hebrew for the Old Testament, without any Aramaic in Daniel, without any Greek for the New Testament. Well, first we have to consider why Joseph Smith would do this. His premise is based upon the insufficiency of the Bible. Remember how I talked about the sufficiency argument? 
Now I'm going to give you the insufficiency argument of Joseph Smith. In the Mormon Articles of Faith, number eight, many of you are aware of this, but I'm going to repeat it, where Joseph Smith wrote this in 1843. We believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. Now this becomes an escape clause for most Latter-day Saints whenever they run into Bible difficulties. Well, it's just not translated correctly. They don't check it out. They don't look at the Greek. They don't look at the Hebrew. They don't look at any manuscript evidence. They just say, off the cuff, not translated correctly. Why? Because I have difficulty. Now that's what it really comes down to in daily practice. But I want to point something out in this insufficiency argument. It didn't begin with the Wentworth letter that this was quoted from. Long before Joseph Smith published the Articles of Faith, he had reasons to doubt the sufficiency of the Bible. The Book of Mormon itself questioned the Bible's sufficiency. In 1 Nephi chapter 13, verses 24 through 29, with, Smith, uh, with Joseph Smith claimed to translate in 1828 and 1829, and then he published it in 1830, states that a record, meaning the Bible, in this verse, or some Mormons, we even say more strictly the New Testament in this verse, will come forth from the mouth of its singular, a Jew. The Jew is identified by some Mormon writers like uh, Hugh Nibley and, and others, other Mormon scholars, as meaning Jesus, a Jew who brings forth the fullness of the gospel. Then the twelve disciples hand this statement from this Jew or this fullness of the gospel from this Jew to the Gentiles. This is what this five-verse passage talks about. But then the great and abominable church gets a hold of it and corrupts it and takes away, as quoting from the Book of Mormon, many parts and covenants that are plain and precious. End of quote. Here we have the missing parts of the Bible. So Smith already had in the Book of Mormon a reason to doubt the sufficiency of the Bible prior to writing the Articles of Faith. So don't begin with the Articles of Faith. Begin with the Book of Mormon in 1830. Actually, 1829, when he was translating it. In 2 Nephi chapter 29 and verses 2 through 4, we also find another doubt cast upon the sufficiency of the Bible when it predicts the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. And in verse 2, it says this. I'm quoting it. And my word shall hiss forth unto the ends of the earth, for a standard unto my people, which are of the house of Israel. Verse 3. And because my word shall hiss forth, many of the Gentiles shall say, A Bible, a Bible. We have a Bible, and there cannot be any more Bible. Now listen to this in verse 4. This is the Book of Mormon. But thus says the Lord, Lord God, O fools! And you know, this is the only place I've ever found where God calls believers in the Bible fools for believing the Bible. And that's the Book of Mormon. Now think of that. Why do the Latter-day Saints not use their Bible as much as the Book of Mormon? Because they're already told if you believe this is all there is, you're a fool. And God said that. O oh, fools, they shall have a Bible, and it shall proceed forth from the Jews, mine ancient covenant people. And then again, in 2 Nephi 29.10. Wherefore, because that ye have a Bible, ye need not suppose that it contains all my words, neither need ye suppose that I have not caused more to be written. Now this forms a basis, again, for Joseph Smith to doubt the sufficiency of the Bible. There's another area of his history where he has room for doubting the Bible, and that's his first vision story of 1820. Now aside from the lectures I can give on the varying accounts of the first vision, for the sake of argument, while well, giving the benefit of the doubt of the 1820 vision, in the Pearl of Great Price, Joseph Smith's history, chapter 1 and verse 36, he states that the angel Moroni came to him and said these words. After telling me these things, he commenced quoting the prophecies of the Old Testament. He first quoted part of the third chapter of Malachi, and he quoted also the fourth or last chapter of the same prophecy, though with a little variation from the way that it reads in our Bibles. So he has reasons to doubt that the Bible 
is valid. The Book of Mormon says it's not valid, and Moroni said it wasn't valid. It's different, in other words. Now, in that kind of an argument, you have Joseph Smith in this story, again, granting him the premise of his 1820 vision. He has Moroni, who's either telling the truth or lied about the Bible, or he has to choose, well, maybe the Bible's wrong and Moroni's right. And that's the dilemma that he tries to give to his people. Now, after publishing the Book of Mormon in March of 1830, Joseph Smith began retranslating the Bible three months later, in June of 1830. When he wrote the Book of Moses that's found in the Pearl of Great Price, chapters 1 through 6, and then the final chapters were written later in December of 1830 uh, when Sidney Rigdon joined in, which is the next point that I make, the Campbellite preacher and convert to Mormonism, Sidney Rigdon, joined with Joseph Smith. He met him in November of 1830 and then uh, met with him on December 10th. And a few days following that meeting, Joseph Smith's already prophesying over him, saying in a revelation from Doctrine and Covenants section 35, that Sidney Rigdon is going to help him translate the Bible. Sidney Rigdon already went to seminary, already understood the Bible, and already kn knew some of the languages, so he was the primary candidate for helping him retranslate the Bible. But it also may explain why some of the Campbellite doctrines and notions and persuasions were found in the Joseph Smith translation, which incidentally matched some of the same Campbellite persuasions that are found in the Book of Mormon. Now, how was the Book of Mormon, I'm sorry, how was the uh, Joseph Smith translation translated since Smith did not know Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek? Well, he admitted that much, that he didn't know these three languages. As a matter of fact, the history of the church states that his first lesson in Hebrew was some two and a half years after he finished his translation of the Bible. That's History of the Church, Volume 2, pages 318 and 383. So one way to convince his followers and evidently himself, that his translation was valid, was decredited to the power of God. How did he do it? By the power of God. Don't need manuscripts, I don't need Hebrew, I don't need Greek. So Joseph Smith's New Testament, actually in the same pen that wrote the sections that I saw crossed out, and the handwritten tablet that went with it, his uh, manuscript for the New Testament actually has in his own writing, translated by the power of God. Now this indicates that Smith thought that this was a finished work. It was accomplished by God's power, uh, which is why also in 1867, when the reorganized church published their first edition of the Joseph Smith translation, the title page said that it was corrected, the Bible was corrected by Joseph Smith through the spirit of revelation. Now in our following study, the verses we're going to look at from this, uh, we're going to test this spirit of revelation. Because it's either going to vindicate Joseph Smith and prove that he's a true prophet, or it's going to prove that he's a phony and fraud in his translation and that it's false. Now, if proven true, then it complements his role as prophet, seer, and revelator. But if it is found to be false, then it does the opposite. It shows him to be misguided by this spirit of prophecy. It's an evil work. It's wicked. It's sin. It violates what we read in Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6. He's found to be a liar. And it also would cast doubt upon his other translations and his other works. Now, using the Joseph Smith translation to evangelize Mormons, how do I do it? I've given you already a few hints at this. But today's Latter-day Saint has this official King James Version that I'm holding up here in front of you, published by the Mormon Church. In its footnotes, the reader will find an occasional JST in capital letters, which indicates where the Joseph Smith translation improved upon the King James translation. And it is, in fact, the Joseph Smith translation that's differing from the King James as the preferred translation, since it was translated by the gift and power of God. Now, some portions, this is an interesting part of this, some portions of Joseph Smith's translation uh, were so voluminous that they had to add an appendix to the back. Here's Genesis, where it couldn't fit in the footnotes of Genesis, but they had to add chapter and verse in the appendix for Genesis, Isaiah, Exodus, Isaiah, Matthew, uh, all the way to the book of Revelation, where they add chapter and verse after chapter and verse of additional scripture that Joseph Smith added to the Bible that's not supported by any Hebrew in the Old Testament and not supported by any Greek in the New Testament. 
Now this can be useful, this volume, in witnessing to Latter-day Saints, and I've won Latter-day Saints to the Lord uh, by using their own edition of the Bible. Uh, the Bible, though, as we've gone through our ground-laying work, when properly defended, especially in light of the Hebrew and Greek texts, is an important source for winning Mormons to Jesus. Uh, what I mean by this is that you've got software available where you can get interlinear translations of the Greek right in front of their eyes. You've got software that does the interlinear Hebrew. You've got online versions. If you don't have software, you can always go online and find interlinear translations. And in that way, every time you give a Hebrew word or a Greek word from the Bible, from your own memory, perhaps, from your own Bible teachers uh, who give you Hebrew and Greek, then you're defending the Bible from its original translation and original source. That's what we call good apologetics. Now, don't let the Mormon beat you down with the eighth article of faith. Instead, when they begin to quote it, well, that part is true insofar as it's correctly translated, I let them quote it. I want to hear them say it because I ask them, would you like to know if it's correctly translated? And that's when I take them to the interlinear Hebrew or the interlinear Greek so they can look at it with their own eyes, even though they won't understand the Hebrew, even though they will not understand the Greek, they do trust, for some reason, they do trust the interlinear when I show it to them. And it aids you in being able to provide a good witness. I'll tell you about a man named Bruce real fast. I had a man in my uh, home. Uh, his name was Bruce. He was a Latter-day Saint. I'd been witnessing to him for a while, and I decided to go through the Joseph Smith translation with him and show him why Joseph Smith failed as a prophet, and he should not trust Joseph Smith. If he failed with the Bible, then it was just automatic that Bruce was going to say he failed with the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, and the Book of Mormon itself. So as he was going through the Bible, I, I, I enjoyed this man because he loved looking at my Greek interlinear. He'd never seen one before. And I could read the Greek to him, but I didn't try to show off or anything like that. But I would just point at the Greek terms. I had my Strong's Concordance so he could look it up himself. I'd, I just sent, spent hours and hours, invite him over for dinner and, and, and time to, to fellowship together and just talk about the scriptures. And as he was going through it, I said, you know what, I have an idea. Why don't you call your bishop? Because he started doing this eighth article of faith on me. Well, it's perhaps incorrectly translated. It's true insofar as it's correctly translated. I said, why don't you call your bishop? He hasn't seen the interlinear. And ask him about this, this one verse. We had a verse we were stuck on. And he was absolutely certain now that that was correctly translated the way the King James had it instead of the way Joseph Smith gave his retranslation of it. So I said, I will venture to say that when you call your bishop, he will not even crack it open. He will not even look at it. He will just quote the eighth article of faith to you verbatim and tell you just to brush it aside because it's true insofar as it is correctly translated. And he called his bishop, and he said, I have a question about a Bible verse. Well, first bishop said, where are you? <laughs> Talking about Greek interlinears and all of this. And uh, what are you doing, Bruce? And so he uh, told him what he was doing. He was studying with me, and, and uh, he asked the bishop this question about this Bible verse that was stumping him. But then he had straightened out just by looking at the Greek with me. And as, just as quickly as that, his bishop said, well, that's only true insofar as it's correctly translated. And he said, thank you very much, and he hung up. He said, I'm ready to listen more. And through that evening, we studied together, and he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. So you see, people will be hungry for God's word. I've often said about people in the cult, whether it's Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or any of them, uh, and just like I was with the children of God, that people who are in the cults are searching for Jesus, but someone handed them a counterfeit. And we have to see it in that way. It's much different than the person who doesn't even care. But these people care enough to at least join something, but somebody handed them a counterfeit. Now next comes the fun part. This is where we compare the Joseph Smith translation to the Hebrew and Greek texts of the Bible. The possibilities of what you can go through with a Latter-day Saint on this is endless. Uh, all you really need to do is get a copy of the uh, King James translation and just go through looking for the JSTs at the bottom or if you want to do a shortcut just go to that appendix and study those compare them to your Bible and you'll see where he added to and took away from the Word of God none of it is supported by the Hebrew and the Greek so the possibility is almost endless as far as where you can turn and show them where Joseph Smith did not uh, translate according to what the original languages were now one note that I particularly find useful and I used this in a debate with Van Hale. You've perhaps heard of him on radio out here. Uh, 
he came down to California to Biola University uh, with his late co cohort, uh, Bill Forrest, and debated uh, Robert Passantino and myself at Biola University. And I used this Joseph Smith translation uh, during the debate, and it did score a pretty interesting point because they didn't have any answer to come back with. Uh, and that is, if you turn to the Song of Solomon, uh, in the Joseph Smith translation, you'll find a note in there, Solomon's Songs, chapter 1. And most Mormons will argue for an open canon of Scripture. And that's one of the things that Van Hale was arguing for during this debate. Because without an open canon of Scripture, they cannot justify the existence of the Book of Mormon. They cannot justify the existence of the Doctrine and Covenants of the Pearl of Great Price. So while we were in this debate, I told the Mormon panel that you actually have a greater problem than I do. You keep challenging me on why we have 66 books in our Protestant Bible, and this is one of the arguments that Van Hill projected. But I said, I want to challenge you. Why do you have 65 books in your Bible? He said, well, I don't have 65 books in, your, in my Bible. And I said, well, let's turn to the Song of Solomon. Joseph Smith wrote in his manuscript, and it's right here in your own version. I'm using his Bible by now. That the JST manuscript states that the Songs of Solomon are not inspired scripture. So you can just take that, tear it out. It's not inspired according to Joseph Smith. It doesn't belong there. And now you've got 65 books. We spent the rest of that time debating why he had 65 books instead of why I have 66. It's one of my favorite ones to deal with. Now, there's some categories that I've given you in your outline of, these are just categories I can give you for ease of, of your outline and ease of sake. You can fill these in, fill in the blanks with all kinds of other uh, passages as you study this. But one of the categories I can give you is Joseph Smith had additional doctrines he added to the Bible through his inspired translation. Now, this includes both false doctrines and doctrines that are misplaced. And what I mean by misplaced doctrines, New Testament doctrines that are somehow put into the book of Genesis as if Adam believed in them and, and so forth. Uh, now, an example of this, uh, I've given a couple of three examples here, is racism is a false doctrine, but Joseph Smith added it to the book of Genesis. It's not in the Hebrew. This is not supported by the Hebrew manuscripts. But Genesis chapter 7 and verse 10 in the inspired version says, and there was a blackness came upon all the children of Canaan, and they were despised among all people. Now this racism that he added to the book of Genesis, every Latter-day Saint would have to say, that's authentic. That's valid. That's a good source. And it's because Joseph Smith was wrestling with the racist problem at the time. And they came up with all kinds of theories about uh, the black people on the earth. And one of them was that the blackness was on them because of a curse upon Cain. And that's Genesis 7.10, but not found in any Bibles that you would validate because it's not in the Hebrew manuscripts. Another one that he added, another doctrine, additional doctrine, is Adam was baptized in water. You may not know this, but they claim that he was baptized in the name of the only begotten Son, later on named in that same verse as Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is mentioned in the book of Genesis, according to Joseph Smith. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 53, I'll quote it from the Joseph Smith translation. And he also said to him, If thou wilt turn unto me and hearken unto my voice and believe and repent of all thy transgressions and be baptized even in water in the name of my only begotten Son who is full of grace and truth, which is Jesus Christ. Two Greek words somehow end up in Genesis in the Hebrew text. And the only name which shall be given under heaven whereby salvation shall come unto the children of men and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So now he got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Asking all things in his name. So now he prays in the name of Jesus. And whatsoever ye shall ask, it shall be given you. Another doctrine, it's a misplaced doctrine, a New Testament doctrine, a series of New Testament do doctrines that are misplaced as additional doctrines by Joseph Smith in his translation. These are good to witness with because when you use these, you sit down with them, you say, find that in the Hebrew. You pull out your, your Hebrew interlinear. You show them the verses. It's absent. Those texts don't even exist that he wrote. Uh, you do not find them in any manuscripts in all the entire world. You also find uh, another section I have here called Contradictory Doctrines. Uh, these are sort of interesting. I have fun with these. 
because these are in the footnotes of Genesis, if you were to turn to this in the volume that I have here today. Genesis 6, 6, which is also found in Moses 8, 5 of the Pearl of Great Price. Joseph Smith, in his inspiration by the spirit of prophecy and the spirit and power of God, changed the word God, or Lord, I mean, uh, changed the word Lord to the word Noah. So the question is, you put them side by side, who repented? Did the Lord relent, or did Noah repent? Well, he didn't like the idea that the Lord relented, so he put Noah in there. Now, what does the Hebrew manuscript say? Yahweh says the Lord. There's no question about it. And so you find Joseph Smith changing the Lord to Noah. Again, you look at the manuscripts. There's no manuscript on earth that has the word Noah in there, but yet Joseph Smith changed it under the inspiration of his spirit of prophecy, spirit of revelation. Exodus 10.20. Joseph Smith did not like that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, so he changed it. And if you look in the Exodus 10.20 of the uh, Joseph Smith translation notes, you will find that it says, Joseph Smith, translation, JST, changed to Pharaoh. Uh, he has Pharaoh hardening his own heart, trying to make it consistent perhaps with his, his own thoughts on this, but it's wrong. It does not have that in the Hebrew text. When you look at your Hebrew text uh, on your computers, online, or if you've got hard copies of the uh, Hebrew Old Testament, you will see that it is not in there. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1, a New Testament one I give you. Now this, these are just different examples. There's dozens of these as you do your own research on this, and each one, any one of them, can become a valid point of sharing with a Latter-day Saint about Joseph Smith. Did he really have the authorization of God to change the Bible. Uh, Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. We all know about the trials and temptations of Jesus by the devil. Your text will say that he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Well, Joseph Smith didn't like that, so in your Joseph Smith translation, it has a footnote, JST, that he didn't get tempted of the devil, but to be with God. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be with God not to be tempted of the devil. Well, again, you look at the Greek interlinear, you uh, use any resource you have on the Greek, let them look at it. This is, by the way, the one that really convinced Bruce, this fellow I told you about. When he saw that, that was too much of a change. He said, there's a big difference between the devil and God. I said, Bruce, you're right. A big difference. And he said, that says, that, that does say uh, devil there, and he had no question about it, that it was not the word for God, theos, uh, in the text. And this is very convincing to many people who are willing to study this. Romans chapter 4, I like this one. Uh, a clear verse about faith and grace. He adds works to it. Sticks the word works in there. Romans 4, 16, you are justified. How are you justified? Well, here's what it says. You are justified by faith is what the Bible says. He adds the words and works. <laughs> You're justified by faith and works. Uh, Joseph Smith corrected the Bible on grace. It contradicts the Bible on grace. Now, additional words. Another section I give you. Uh, you can do, again, your own studies on these. Uh, by additional words, what I mean is these are words that do not even belong in the biblical text, just like many of the chapters that he added to it. But it's sort of a different twist on it. Uh, there are some that parallel Book of Mormon terms, uh, which Smith is obviously trying to say, well, the Bible doesn't match the Book of Mormon, but if I toss a Book of Mormon term into the Bible, then maybe somebody will think that the Bible and the Book of Mormon agree. So one example is uh, a term not found in the Bible is secret combinations. There was a lot of business going on in that day. Uh, Anti-Masonic newspapers are published all over the country. I have one of these from uh, 1805. Uh, there were a lot of things about uh, combinations, and it's a good thing he wasn't into other conspiracy theories like, uh, conspiracy theories like uh, JFK or, or the Illuminati or all of these other UFOs and all the other conspiracies that people come up with, but they had their own, and that was secret combinations. Well, that ends up in his translation. It was in the newspapers in the day. Secret combinations found in the Book of Mormon, uh, 3rd Nephi 7, verses 6 through 9, and then you find Joseph Smith bringing this into his translation of the Bible in Genesis 5.37, also in the Pearl of Great Price, which is from Genesis chapter 5 in the Joseph Smith translation. For from the days of Cain, 
there was a secret combination. This would be like secret handshakes, much like they do in the temple. Secret combination, and their works were in the dark, and they knew every man his brother. Now, Smith also had another term that he used uh, called choice seer, which is not found in any Hebrew text in the books of, book of Genesis. But in uh, Genesis chapter 50, verses 26 and 27, he uses it twice there. And uh, there's two verses from the Book of Mormon, uh, 2 Nephi 3, 6 and 7, that is quoted then by Joseph Smith into the book of Genesis as if Moses knew what was going to be said in the book of, of 2 Nephi. And he uses the same verse with choice seer used twice. Cain uh, is another example. And Cain said uh, concerning himself, uh, he was a master mahan. Well, what does that sound like? Master mason? And so anti-masonry going on in that day. Uh, and again, like the secret combinations that he was against. And this again, Campbellites were this way too. Uh, they were always against the lodges and always against Freemasonry. And this is where I believe Sidney Rigdon added his hand to it. Uh, Cain became a master mahan. Now, in Genesis 5.16, also found in Moses uh, 5.31 of the Pearl of Great Price, and Cain said, truly, I am a mahan, uh, the master of this great secret that I may murder and get gain. Wherefore, Cain was called master mahan, and he glorified in his wickedness. Uh, words that Joseph Smith invented and placed into the Bible to try to justify his beliefs. Uh, not supported by the Hebrew, you bring out the Hebrew, and you don't find any chapter like this, any verse like this in the Old Testament. Uh, and then Exodus 33.20 in the Joseph Smith translation. Now, this was one of those that was so large, you'll find it only in this back portion uh, of the Joseph Smith translation under the book of Exodus, one of those larger portions, but one that no less is interesting to look at. Where he adds this, thou canst not see my face. Now, we know that uh, in chapter 33 of Exodus, Moses goes up on Mount Sinai. God said, you cannot see my face and live. Uh, well, Joseph Smith, because of his visions, uh, wants to add something to this. Thou canst not see my face at this time. <laughs> you see, I underlined that. Uh, at this time, he adds, because he doesn't believe the word of God the way the Hebrew manuscript says it, but uh, rather his adjustment to the Hebrew manuscript. Now, there's another uh, way you can look at it. And that is the additional chapters and verses. Uh, Joseph Smith added endless verses. Uh, just in Genesis 50, it was well over 800 words that he added to that one chapter. But in this one, he has a very unique verse concerning himself. Now, I find it interesting that he writes the Book of Mormon, and he talks about himself, prophesies about himself in the Book of Mormon. He has his Pearl of Great Price with the first uh, vision of Joseph Smith, and he prophesies of himself uh, through that revelation that he's going to be the one that brings this hidden book to the earth. And then, why not the Bible? And now he adds a portion to the book of Genesis where Moses prophesies of Joseph Smith coming by name in chapter 33 of Genesis 50. There is no chapter uh, 50, verse 33 in the Hebrew text, but Joseph Smith added it just by pure invention. He says this, And that seer will I bless, and they shall seek to destroy him, uh, or they, who, they that seek to destroy him shall be confounded. For this promise I give to you, for I will remember, from, uh, remember you from generation to generation, and his name shall be called Joseph, and it shall be after his, the name of his father, and he shall be like unto you, for the thing which the Lord shall bring forth by his hand shall bring my people unto salvation. So he writes about himself in Genesis 50 and verse 33. You also have the entire books of Moses in the Pearl of Great Price and the book of Matthew in the Pearl of Great Price that are part of the Joseph Smith translation. Uh, a lot of people aren't aware of that, but the Pearl of Great Price, the bulk of it is the very Joseph Smith translation before they began publishing it in their King James Version. Now, this is one of my favorite ones. As a young Baptist, I told you my story of salvation. As a young Baptist, I... Uh, was still learning the Word of God when I met with the Mormon missionaries. And, and of course, the first time I met with them, when my, when my grandmother sent them over, I was real quick to turn to Revelation chapter uh, 22 and verse 18. And as a young Baptist boy, I was going to tell them a thing or two and say to them, chapter 18 and 19 prophesies against you, for John wrote these words, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. 
if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life and from the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. And I got clobbered by the Mormon missionaries when I read that. They just decimated me. Because I didn't realize, I wasn't reading it thoroughly, that it only dealt with that book, the prophecy of this book. John's writing the book of Revelation, which is the only prophetic book he was referring to there. So how do you deal with this in the Joseph Smith translation? Quite simply, and it's fun. Because I'm going to show you all the places where Joseph Smith added to the book of Revelation, and all the places that he took away from the book of Revelation. And I love showing this to Latter-day Saints. The highlighted yellow. Uh, I'll have this at my book table. You're welcome to come and look at it. And I've got over 40 places where I put plus signs. I, I show it to more of a just like I'm showing to you. Say all these plus signs are additions. All these subtractions are, deletion, or, are deleted. And uh, let me show you this. Smith did both. He added two and. He didn't do one or the other. He did both. He added to and took away from the book of Revelation itself. So I like to sit down with Mormons now, and I don't try to trick them or anything, but I, I read to them. I said, can I read a verse to you from the book of Revelation? Well, they think they know what I'm going to say. And I read to them out of their own Bible here, uh, the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 22 and verses 18. They start sitting on the edge of their chair, just getting inches closer to me. They're ready to pounce on me. And I said, now, I realize, I stopped them before they even say, I said, now, that doesn't pertain to the whole Bible. And they look at me and they say, it doesn't? I said, no, it doesn't pertain to the whole Bible. It pertains to the book of Revelation. Now, could you answer a question? I turn to the back of it where it says Joseph Smith translation. And I say, all these portions, as if you were a Latter-day Saint, all these portions of the book of Revelation, can you explain how those were added to? And then I go back to Revelation 22, 18. What will be added to him, the plagues in this book? I said, I feel sorry for that man that added to this, because those plagues are added to him. And then when you show them the things that are taken away, hey, God wrote it, I believe it, that settles it. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life. Where's Joseph Smith then? I say it's impossible for him to be in heaven. Because Revelation chapter 22, verse 19 says, if he took away from the book of Revelation, and I, I've said that to Mormon missionaries. You know, I've never had any of them hit me. I've had them disagree with me. Yet, yeah, thank you. You're a bad subject. Yeah? <laughs> I never have. I, I actually have never had them actually get angry with me yet. They just sit there stoic, and they're thinking about it. How can we justify him adding to and taking away from the book of Revelation? That is one of the most powerful witnesses of my whole message to save the best to last. And that's Revelation 22, 18 and 19 from this volume. That should encourage you to go to Deseret Industries if you want and buy one of these just to use it for witnessing from the book of Revelation alone. And uh, as a matter of fact, they give them to you. If you tell them you're not a member, they'll give this to you. So the... Uh, witness that you can do from Revelation is very important. And I tell these young men, I don't want to see you end up in the same way. And now you have to make a choice. This is where I bring it home to the plan of salvation. You need to make a choice. If you walk out of my home believing your prophet with these additions, then you have added to it by consent. Because you're saying every conference... You're saying what? I sustain these scriptures. So you now have added to it by your sustaining of it. And you've also taken away by your sustaining of it. And when I do that right square, their eyeballs get big. Because that's what they have done. They have consented to Joseph Smith's translation. They may not have taken their pen like I saw in Independence, Missouri, and strike verses out or add to it. But their consent is the same. And I asked them, which one of these things do you want to happen to you? I testify to you. Anyone who adds to these plagues will be added. And by that time, they're ready to pack and leave. <laughs> or they're ready to repent. We've had Mormons that repent at that point. I really have. I've had them look at Revelation with me, and I've had them repent 
of Mormonism. And I tell them, you need to repent of it. Just like I had to repent of the children of God, you need to repent of Mormonism. It's false doctrine. That's false doctrine. I take them out. When they repent, I take them out and get them a new Bible. I don't want them to have this. Unless they're going to use it to witness after they get saved, but I take them out and get them a new Bible if I can. They need something reliable. And I start to, to educate them and, and uh, help them to understand the Word of God as God gave it. So that's how, in my message today, uh, Joseph Smith violates the Hebrew, he violates the Greek, and they are violating the same when they sustain it. So that's how you use this for your witness. Thank you and God bless you.